So what will be the inflation tamer as we start to move into the fall here in the markets, how this is going to affect not only the capital markets, crypto, and in general, I think uh, securities, Bitcoin, all those good things. Really, the position of the market is really leveraged against one major component, and that is the role of inflation and its effect on not only here in the United States, but globally. Uh, we're going to dive in deep. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into Tech Path. I'll, obviously, today we'll dive into some Bitcoin news, uh, talk a little bit about where the market's set up, but a lot of different, um, and I think intriguing things are happening right now within the industry when you think of the financial sector as a whole. Not only just here in the United States, it's almost as we're seeing somewhat of a unison lockstep with what's happening in the EU, with what, what is happening in China. And a lot of these even emerging markets where we're seeing more and more integration into the financial system. And really what uh, circles around all of these things is macro. And we thought, hey, today let's go in and do a deep dive on macro. What's causing all this and when will the potential be there for a recovery? And we'll take a look at that with, of course, Jeff Ross, who's been with us before, who's the founder and managing director over at Valeshire Capital Group. And of course, Darius Dale uh, has, of course, been our show as well. He's also the founder and CEO at 42 Macro. So great having both of you guys on. Oh, it's a pleasure. Great to be Thanks. here. Thanks for having us. Excellent. So both of you have, both of you guys have been rock stars on episodes uh, previously, uh, a lot of people do, you know, have tons of comments and questions about both of your angles on things, and I think everybody uh, knows you and recognizes you here on our channel. So I want to get into it uh, first with a few things, and uh, it primarily looks at just inflation in general. Uh, and if you look at inflation and where it is today, and I'll start with you, Jeff. Um, is there, and we've talked about this, you and I have had a, many conversations about this, but. Do you feel like there's any real easy fix to this? Would there be something that the administration, at least you're from the U.S., could do to try to help appease the current situation as we see it? Is there an easy fix? Well, the easy answer to that is no. Um, but there are things that the administration could be doing. I wish the administration would be focusing more on the supply side, to be honest. I wish that they would be doing things to basically uh, figure out how to bring back infrastructure to the United States, how to build up our you know, oil capacity, um, right. how to bring manufacturing back to the United States, do things basically that, that take a while um, to have their effects felt throughout the economy and throughout society but that benefit um, U.S. citizens for years to come. I don't like it that they only have basically a demand destruction approach from the Federal Reserve. I think this is the wrong way to do it. Yeah. Uh, and I think that it's very uh, hurtful to Americans. So so I would love to see the administration uh, actually step up to the plate and and basically say, you know what, we're going to we're going to deal with inflation while it's hot, but we're going to do things under, you know, behind the scenes. We're going to get Americans back to work. We're going to rebuild infrastructure that would have beneficial long term effects but I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Yeah, there. this was an article over here uh, that kind of referred to this very thing. That it was. I wish they were as a painless way. Actually, there is. It's just stop raising rates. Uh, that, would be, that would be the painless way. But, of course, all of that plays into things, Darius, that you talk a lot, a lot about, and that is, you know, some of the things that really have to get under control before we can start, uh, or when we, I say we, the Fed, can start actually uh, stop start the stop of raising rates. When you look at the things that you would say, these things have to occur, and, uh, and, and we're going to talk about the, the four steps that you've tweeted about before many times, but when you look at this in the short term, uh, is there anything that Chair Powell is looking for that would give him just one glimmer of hope that could start this downtrend? Obviously, the CPI numbers weren't a good start, but what are your thoughts? Yeah, definitely, Paul. So there, there is some glimmers of hope. So let's attack this problem from a couple different angles. Um, one, what is happening on the ground in terms of the data, but also what probably they should be doing in the context of uh, Jeff's previous comments. Let's start with the first. So what's happening in the data is we are seeing an amelioration of supply chain disruptions, whether you look at some of the leading indicators like the percentage of respondents in the PMI surveys, particularly from the ISM, um, we're back right at that percentage of respondents that are reporting slower supplier delivery times. You know, we're back down to levels, you know, the kind of in the high teens that are more associated mm -hmm. with, you know, traditional cycle peaks, you know, d uh, you know, off of levels that were like 60, 70 percent at the highs of the supply chain disruption. So we are seeing that flow through to core goods inflation. It's compounding at 2.8 percent on a three month annualized rate of change basis. That's well uh, north or well south of other measures of core inflation, you know, that are tracking at six to eight 
percent on a three month annualized basis. So we are seeing some positive um, dynamics. The thing I would uh, sort of challenge, um, you know, with respect to Jeff's comments earlier, and, and you know, respectfully uh, disagree. The, the problem with sort of addressing inflation from a purely supply side, um, uh, you know, sort of a prescription set, really sort of um, it kind of ignores a few things. One, we are in a fully employed economy. The unemployment rate's at three point five percent. Where are we going to get the additional labor supply to actually build the things that we need to build to increase supply of, go of mm -hmm. goods and different services? And then number two, we're sort of forgetting that more so than any other economy in the world, the U.S. overstimulated fiscally. We threw $6.4 trillion into our $15 trillion economy and said, go deal with it from an inflation perspective. Yeah. And now we're dealing with the uh, consequences of that. So, and this is kind of a question for both of you to, to I think to both of your points here, uh, the challenge in being able to rebuild infrastructure here in the United States, obviously, as we see a shift toward what could be um, powerhouses from a manufacturing side of things in Europe and even in China that start to wane a bit. The problem we have here in the U.S. obviously is an aging uh, demographic, which is the boomers, all of which are now starting to age into their 65 uh, retirement age. And we're going to start to see more and more capital exit the markets as well as workforce. Uh, not necessarily a perfect you know, storm because of the fact that we are in a, a very unique situation to be able to actually do what you're talking about, Darius, and that is rebuild, or Jeff, uh, rebuild the infrastructure here in the United States, whether you look at oil production, tech, you know, chips, you name the, the sector, uh, all the way down into pharmaceuticals. All those things really need to come to, really kind of come to fruit for us to be able to really kind of expand in the market and see us recover out of this. I wanna talk about a couple of things that, um, would flow into that. And that is around uh, capitulation within the market. Because there's two things that play into this that people have talked about before, that market capitulation has to happen before we see a recovery. And I wanna get your uh, question on it. This was a Bloomberg article, begging markets to capitulate, uh, which obviously means we finally get a rebound. Darius, let's lead off with you. Do you think that has to happen with the way that you see it within 42 Macro? Is that something that you think needs to be a core element here? Or, or do you think this is just an invitation uh, to wait on more bad news coming from the macro uh, pressures? Yeah, so I, I don't know if it's more about waiting on bad news, but more being able to have some sort of confidence when you peer around the corner uh, that mm -hmm. you know things are starting to improve at the margins. Obviously, when you buy the lows of any bear market, it's not going to be good in absolute terms. But you can actually start to look for some signals that things might be improving on a three, four, five, six month basis. To answer the question specifically, you know, when we look at, you know, the history of bear markets in the U.S., and I'm anchoring on the S&P 500 as a proxy for risk assets, you know, there have been 17 bear markets uh, in the last, you know, call it 100 years with a median decline of about 28 percent. Well, what I don't think people realize is that they almost always end with capitulatory style selling. If you look yep. at the last three months specifically in those bear markets, you know, we typically have a, a, a max drawdown of on average or not on average on meet on a median basis of minus 19 percent. So we typically accelerate into the downside, which is why I think a lot of investors are sitting on their hands here. Yeah. Back to a chart here. Fund managers also view risk as their most elevated since 2008. See those risks spread across the world. They entered this year with a view that this is what is ironic to me is they entered this view the, the year pretty much in a safe place or was what thought was to be, how, how could we think that? I mean, I, I don't know that any rational trader was looking at this as a safe place in February, even in January to a certain extent. Um, do you feel that, uh, when, especially when you look at cash being king, how long before we start to see movement in the market, Jeff, when you look at, you know, you're managing a fund right there with Valshares. What are your, what are the, what's the, what's the temperature right now in your investors? Well, my investors are still pretty concerned about what's going on. You know, they read the headlines. They're scared by, by what they see. They're affected day to day by these high prices, right? Food prices mm -hmm. are high. Everything's high. Healthcare is high. You go, you go down the list. So life is hard for a lot of people and people are scared and they all want to know. Everybody always asks me like, have we hit the bottom? Have we hit the bottom? Right. Anytime we see a one or two day rally in stocks, they're like, is this it? Did we bottom? Mm -hmm. And and I look out and I look at the macro and I know Darius has, uh, Darius has some of just the, the best uh, research on this, but you know, what is, what does the macro situation look like? It still looks like we're going to continue to slow down 
for the next um, several months, several quarters, actually, probably into, you know, well into the first half of 2023, even extending mm-hmm. into, you know, the summer months. So, and on top of that, the Federal Reserve and all of the central banks are still maintaining a fairly hawkish, I should be careful, not all of the central banks, most of the central banks are still trying to maintain a fairly hawkish stance. Um, right. That's not a good combination. When you come off of high valuations of equities, historically high valuations, like we saw in Q4 of 2022, uh, record high valuations in bonds. Uh, real estate was was extremely highly priced as well, highly valued as well. We're working through all of that at the same time the Fed is being hawkish because of this sticky high inflation. So I look out and I still don't really find a lot of reasons to be optimistic. I still think to Darius's point that we're going to see some sort of capitulation type event. I don't know how quickly that happens. It could be uh, in the fourth quarter here of 2022, but it's probably yeah. going to be more like sometime in 2023. So I just tell my my um, investors, you know what, we're gonna we're gonna stick with the trends. The trends are still are still clearly bearish. Uh, if you want to be long things, you can be long the dollar. Uh, maybe you can be long some energy sector stocks. Um, that that works right now. But for the most part, the, the play is to be short. And that's what we're doing mm-hmm. with our clients. Interesting. I was looking further in this article. They hit on uh, belief that liquidity is drying up uh, leads naturally uh, to predictions that the Fed will soon have to execute the pivot. And this is something that you know many people have talked about. Uh, we've had guys on here uh, that believe we're in you know, crypto spring, Mark Yusko, uh, great, you know, great investor. And I, and I respect Mark a lot and his thoughts about it. And in many cases, I look at that and say, there's got to be some window here that does start to open up. But when I look at it from a macro standpoint, talk to a lot of analysts here, it just seems like it's more of the same uh, coming from that. Darius, when you look at this, because I, I, I want to, we'll show a tweet here in a minute of where this goes on your cycle. But the point that we're in right now, where investors are, in a one to 10 scale of investors coming back into the market, where do you think that would lay today? Well, I think we're, we're very much still on the, on the, on the out, outflows. We haven't really seen uh, the real kind of, you know, that to our point earlier, capitulatory style selling yet. And it just made some yeah. excellent points that I'd like to elaborate on just with a couple of statistics. So um, the first point being uh, the point about cash in terms of cash being king and investors um, not really not wanting to take risk, cash balances being as high as we've seen in a long time in that Bank of America fund manager survey. You know, there's a reason for that. You know, when you look at a three month T bill yield, it's yielding 268 basis points higher mm-hmm. than the S&P 500's dividend yeah. yield, not the earnings yield, the dividend yield. Yeah. You got to go back to 2000 to see a spread uh, that wide. So clearly there's a reason for the cash and the concern. Um, for, for risk assets. Um, and then when you look at in terms of a household ownership of equities, um, you know, as a ratio of their total assets, you know, we're still at 31%. You know, 31% is right around the peak that we saw prior to the bursting of the dot-com bubble. You know, yep. we came off the highs of 36% from last summer, but there's a there's a long way to go down from that perspective of that ratio to the lows that we observed in 2002 and 2008. Again, we don't necessarily have to go there, but again, we're still tracking at levels that are pretty consistent with prior bear market or bull market peaks, not a bear market trough. With that being the case, uh, if you listen to Chamath Paliapatia, he's uh, he's been a legendary investor in the SPAC space. Uh, and, and he did a, a podcast just the other day he, and really kind of boiled down to a couple of clips that we played here on the show. But what he, what he meant was is that we could be entering that zone of the bottom But he was concerned that what we could see in the security space is even more pain coming from the titans, Amazon, Google, Apple, et cetera, uh, especially in a potential, you know, capitulatory scenario. Are you guys in agreement with that? Or do you feel like that's maybe a a further ways off or that never happens and we'll continue to see more pain in other sectors within uh, the securities market? Either one of you can take it. Go ahead, Darius. Oh yeah, so the answer is yes. The <laughs> they, they always they, they always come for the, the you know the, the leaders the, the you know the the winners the the perceived safety towards the end of the, the move right. I mean again let's yeah. forget let's not forget you know passive investing yeah, I think as a ratio of of, of of total you know sort of equity uh, market participation in the U.S. now is roughly about half um, in terms of the share. It's basically on par with active management, and so we have not seen the four hundred one k spigot turn off because we're still in a fully employed America. Now, we right. have a view of 42 macro that we're very unlikely to see a material drawdown in total employment, if only because it's been very difficult 
to find and retain talent in this particular business cycle is evidenced by the decline in the labor force participation rate, employment to population ratio, et cetera. Um, but we still are likely to see a decline. Um, the Fed, the Federal Reserve is forecasting a decline. Right. Um, sure. <laughs> and and I'd be damned if we're going to stand in their way. I mean, this is a, it's a pretty clear stated policy objective. Yeah, I think with labor playing into this and really, I think in general, this gets into kind of that snowball effect going downhill, especially from a business, especially small business. Uh, I get a chance to talk to a lot of small business, you know, CEOs and many of which kind of are on the opposite position of the current labor market right now. In, in essence, that they say, yes, we can't find the right people for the jobs, but at the same time, we're hiring fewer of them. So that in itself also represents, to your point, what could be a slowing uh, labor market, which of course does address you know, a lot what the you know, Fed is trying to do. Cash, of course, being you know the uh, scenario that plays into this. If you're, and, and this is not financial advice for uh, you guys, we're really just trying to study some of the measures that are happening within the market. But, um, and we talk about this a lot, you know, on our show, is that cash position right now, waiting for those events to occur, whether you're a crypto trader or you're a Bitcoin holder. Um, Either one, you're looking for those potential opportunities. Jeff, I know you guys really follow Bitcoin on a very heavy level. When you look at some of the, the scenarios we've seen just over the past few weeks, what is your position right now on Bitcoin? Do you feel like this is still a downtrend or do you think we might see some sort of an up up uh, trend here shortly? Yeah, even though the Bitcoin price has basically been moving sideways for a few months and people are noticing that, people are almost getting bored but it's not doing anything other than sitting on 19,000. That's kind of boring for people who are used to explosive gains and, and big downside uh, losses right. as well. Uh, you know, as far as the thing I look at, we say cash is king. I say momentum is even king uh, over that. And so, so the mm-hmm. momentum for Bitcoin is still pretty strongly bearish. So bearish to the downside. So I expect that at some point when this volatility um, uh uh, comes back to Bitcoin, I think we're going to see a big price movement. And unfortunately, I think it's probably going to continue to move to the downside. And so, right. uh, you know, we have a lot of Bitcoin related positions like Bitcoin miners and things like that on our watch list. I'm definitely not uh, dabbling in any of those right now. I still think they have more downside to come, even though they've gotten really beaten down, you know, 80 to 90 plus percent, some of these Bitcoin miners. So I'm very optimistic that when the bull market returns, they will rip much, much higher and very quickly. Yeah. Uh, but we're still probably months away from that and maybe even quarters away before we go long again. Yeah. Jeff, uh, go ahead. Can I have any, you said something that um, that I think is very important to sort of unpack really quickly here um, in the context that when we get to a new bull market, uh, they're probably rip higher, which I agree with. Um, you typically see, you know, pretty substantial performance in the early phases of any new bull market. I think uh, going back to the S&P analysis we, we cited earlier, you know, I think the median return from those 17 bear markets in the first three months of the new bull market is somewhere around plus 21 percent. Now, that sounds great. Um, and obviously, if you're, you're putting a bait on that of two to three for Bitcoin, that's great. But in the context of the drawdown you typically experience three months into the, the lows of the bear market and the recovery that I just highlighted, you know, on a Kager basis, you're still down um, on a median basis, you're down two percent with an interquartile range of minus seven to minus seven percent to plus three percent. So it effectively is arguing the data, history, 100 years of history are arguing that you don't need to be in a rush to buy your risk assets. It's not win Lambo. It's when right. can I afford my next car payment? And mm-hmm. then I can yeah. think about a Lambo six months after that. I like Absolutely. it. Absolutely. It's Sorry, can I just when... can I just chime in there? Yeah, that's go ahead. such a great point. We're we're still in survival mode, right? Everybody is trying to pick the bottom. Quit trying to pick the bottom. Just relax, everybody. Like let this play out. Don't yeah. be afraid to continue holding large cash positions. We'll know when the bull market is starting again, right? Even if you're a little bit late and you miss the first ten mm-hmm. or fifteen percent, don't worry yeah. about it. Just relax yeah. and stay solvent. That's the most important point right now. Well, I think yeah, you've hit on it uh, a lot with around not not only solvency, but with, okay. So there's a few things that play into this that I've you know as I put together um, my analysis from a lot of different macro minds that are kind of contributing to our show, and, and we get into a lot of this. My question to you, Darius, would be this, and, and there's there's some people that claim we could be in a liquidity crisis and, or a crisis, some people that look at this, well, actually, we could be in a solvency issue, uh, an insolvency issue with banks. Um, the fact that we've got so much cash 
and we're flush in the system at the level we are now, then you have JP Morgan, Bank of America, all the big banks returning what has been some of their best returns yet on this last um, you know, Q3 re- earnings reports. Are we in a position right now? Because it, th- there's going to be a point, I would assume, that a domino starts to have to fall. You're going to have rising rates, so you're going to have um, you know, businesses at risk for default, bad loans starting to occur, and consumer credit starting to get some pressure. With that being the case, wouldn't that put a lot of pressure on cash positions overall, and how does that play out going forward? Uh, it's our belief that cash will become even more kinger in that scenario. So uh, I'll take a, uh, I'll just uh, kind of, um, you know, there's a few things you said that I, I'm not sure I were completely on board with from a research perspective. Um, I don't know that there's really kind of this big snowball or domino in this particular business cycle that we need to be worried about. I um, mean, you know, when we do the analysis on household and corporate sector balance sheets or financial sector leverage, you know, it's just it's 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 very benign. It's extremely mm. benign, and part of that, and and the, you know that that you know the the kind of lack of leverage, the the low, the low growth rate of leverage, you know, sort of um, the terming out of, of financial liabilities. You know, the cash as a percent of total assets. All these different metrics are telling us that hey, look, we should not be expecting this big bang risk in the economy. And and from my perspective, that's positive for the economy, but it's actually yeah. kind of negative for asset markets in the context of what is currently a booming U.S. economy that is contributing to booming core inflation. Right. Yeah, I think that goes along with this article here, The Curse of a Strong U.S. Economy. There was a couple of quotes in here that were interesting. Uh, Strength, kind of a curse more than a blessing. Uh, Signal strength, it was going to get harder to rein in persistent and broad-based inflation, much like what you guys are talking about. Um, Strength coexisting with weakness. How would that occur? Because that, to me, seems like this could be just a lot more of what we have right now, which is more of, unless there's some cataclysmic event in Europe or within the war position that starts to you know, cause a domino effect. Is there anything that you guys are watching uh, that could start to kind of create some sort of move in the right direction in any one of these sectors with what you're seeing right now from an economy standpoint? Well, I, I just got to say that I guess I agree with Darius that I, I think that the economy is going to continue to show strength throughout all of this and that that is mm-hmm. actually bad news, right? So good economic right. news is bad news for risk assets in general. Why? Because that means inflation is going to continue to be sticky high. Even though I think we'll see some mild disinflation, it's still going to remain sticky high. And as long yeah. as inflation remains sticky high, the Fed is going to remain sticky hawkish. They're going to continue to you know put on this tough policy stance. They're going to continue to raise rates and, and hold them higher, that continues to have a negative effect in general on risk assets. And so we this process may continue to go on for quite a while. And so again, I just I agree with Darius. The economy is gonna it's going to feel it somewhat, but I don't think it's going to be a very harsh economic recession. That's one thing that's important for the audience to understand is the economy is different from the stock market. A lot of people conflate the two. They think they're basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. They do kind of go in tandem over the long run, but in the short term, they can go off and do their, go off under their separate ways. So I think it's going to be more pain ahead for risk assets, but the economy itself may not, uh, may not feel it quite as severely. Yeah, there's an interesting point they made in the article. Sources of strength says total consumer spending in a tug of war between declining goods consumption and booming service economy following an enormous overshoot in the consumption of durable. Um, so I think that, yeah, it, all this plays in. But back to your point, Jeff, is that the possibility here right now of seeing any kind of relief, I think, is going to be short. And the likelihood of seeing a very strong you know, position with the Fed uh, after the CPI numbers is going to be real. Do you guys feel, Darius, do you think we're going to get a 75, like what they're talking about right now on the next print? Or what is your opinion? Yeah, unless we get some real, you know, very positive dynamics on the core inflation front uh, out of the October uh, or November um, CPI report, I think there's a done deal that we're 75, 75. I mean, the okay. Fed, this is a J Powell Fed that has consistently throughout his entire tenure um, failed to dis- fail to uh, sort of shock markets in either direction with respect to its policy uh, measures. So uh, it's very clear that, you know, the, the, what's priced into the market is probably what's going to be enacted from a policy standpoint. What the thing about policy, and I'll just end with this really quickly, is that we're still trying to find the terminal Fed funds rate. 
You yeah. know, if we get another inflation surprise to the upside or or core inflation remains sticky, resilient economy equals resilient core inflation. I love uh, Jeff's uh, comment on hawkish and CPI equals or, or sticky CPI equals sticky uh, hawkish Fed. You know, if that stuff continues, which it should based on our analysis of the economy, it's likely that we're going to continue to push to new highs in terms of what the market mm -hmm. is pricing in from a terminal Fed funds rate expectation. That's not good because it not only is that not good from a, obviously just a market signaling standpoint and valuation standpoint, it obviously pushes out the sort of um, kind of return of liquidity that we're all expecting and need uh, for a real sustainable market. Right. Jeff, do you think with uh, a double print of 75s coming the pipe, let's say that that does occur, you know, throughout the end of the year, do you think that's priced into the Bitcoin uh, market as it is today? Or do you feel like Bitcoin will make some adjustments against that? I think priced in is a funny term. I think um, <laughs> uh, the market price, you know, it's it, there are people out there who are um, savvy with what's going on macroeconomically, but a lot of people are just confused with what's happening there. Right. Uh, there's a lot of hopium out there. There's a lot of people who are all in on Bitcoin and or crypto and really, really need it to go higher to make mm -hmm. their lives better. Those are the people I'm concerned about, right? Because they don't have right. a realistic view. Whenever you need the markets to do something and price action to do something, it usually Problem. does the opposite, right? That's that's yeah. what happens before you get wrecked. Um, so I'm concerned for those people that they're just kind of smoking hopium and that there's a chance that they're not going to get what they want. So like I said, all of the macroeconomic indicators I look at point that we probably have more pain to come. Uh, Bitcoin has been, like I said, going flat. Volatility has been squeezed out of it. I think that that's going to return at some point and it's probably going to return to the downside. And I think a lot mm. of Bitcoiners are going to be unhappy with that price movement. Interesting. But it's a, it's a, it'll be a great long-term buying opportunity, but painful in the short term. Well, and, and, and on that note, you know, you guys need to smash the like button because this is going to help others at least learn a little bit about Bitcoin and in general crypto as a whole. So it, it does help the algorithm. So uh, make sure and do that. And if you like uh, when we bring macro stars on like this and you want more of this in depth, let us know. Just hit that like button. It's a good way to start. Uh, Darius, let's get into a tweet you put out. This was I thought this was perfect timing too. phases of the 21 to 23 Fed reaction. Uh, function. And um, Fed ditches transitory. We know that. That's happened. Uh, market uh, pricing and dovish pivot because of phase one. And then Fed says, no, tighter for longer. That's kind of where we are right now. Is that, is that what you feel? Phase three? Yeah, yeah. I would I, I would actually add, we're, we're in phase five now. And so I, I got to update that tweet. But, uh, <laughs> All right. Phase five is, is, is acceptance. We just have oh, to accept okay. the fact yeah. That there is going to be no rate cuts and no QE next year or any or any in any risk manageable time horizon unless all hell breaks loose. Yeah. You know, we, we I think the investors are generally speaking with the wind Lambo, when is the bottom, you know, the kind of nature, general nature of discussions amongst retail investors and even some institutional investors is, you know, sort of when do we buy the dip? And the reality yeah. is this Fed is not going to supply the market with large quantities of liquidity, either through the policy rate setting or through the balance sheet, unless all hell breaks loose from here. So you do not want to be buying into an all hell breaking loose. You want to be buying after that fact. So yeah, it's kind sure. of a catch-22. There, there, there will not be the, the goodies if we don't go through Hades. Yeah, I like it. Uh, well, I don't like the situation, but I like these yeah, opportunities that are building up to what could be uh, a pretty wealth changing event for a lot of people if they're if they're paying attention that's the key you got to be paying attention to the markets really what's happening like to what darius is talking about is really uh caution right now is is a big part of this um jeff i want to touch on this this is something and you you and i've kind of talked a little bit about the european markets uh obviously the uk their new finance minister scrapped almost all the planned tax cuts here recently uh to appease the markets now they kind of backed off here it seems to be if you look at what happened uh, within the UK, I mean, that that's it was a three weeks ago where they had just applied this uh, tax cut and now they've completely pivoted in such a short time. What does this indicate for you, if anything, when you look at how the UK is responding? I think that that shows that, well, first of all, Europe and the UK are ahead of us here in the UK, not ahead of mm -hmm. us in a good way. They're ahead of right. us in the fact that they're further down this 
path of the recession is setting in more deeply. They're in a world of hurt. Energy costs are skyrocketing. You know, utility bills are out of control. Prices are high. People are upset. Things are starting to show signs of instability. So this is what happens when things get unstable. People start doing things. They make rash decisions trying to, quote, save the day. Uh, and then three weeks later, they backtrack and they uh, undo those decisions. They fire the person who was in charge of it and they try to pick a new hero out to help save them. Right. This is what happens when people panic, right? And they're in kind of panic mode. I would say early panic mode right now in Europe and in the UK. And I think we're going to see more of that. Like I said, we, you know, Darius and I are talking about how rough it is here in the US. It's worse over in Europe and it's worse in the UK. They're going to go through much more pain, I think, than we are here. Uh, if I had to be honest. And so I would expect to see more of this kind of thing, more government intervention, more price controls, mm -hmm. uh, uh, more central bank uh, b purchasing of bonds, things like that to save um, markets that are that are feeling increasingly unstable. So more of that to come, unfortunately, before it gets worse. And they're probably going to have a deflationary bus type event before we do here in the U.S., or at least more severely than we do here mm -hmm. in the U.S. That's my take on it. Okay, so there's a market chaos section of this article that kind of drills on this, and I want to get to you on a question here, Darius, but it says the government already, you know, they forced the U-turn. We knew about that. It was a big tax, you know, potential, but they also fired their finance minister, which, um, and this is <laughs> six weeks after the pair took office. So um, not necessarily a good sign for when you have your finance minister, of which this has been a, somewhat a legacy within the UK Parliament and how it's structured a lot of the economy in the UK starting to move in that. With that being the case and what uh, Jeff said, if you looked at a potential where we could see some small upruns on crypto, because right now the UK is still one of our largest audience is the United Kingdom, London, a lot of uh, uh, you know Western Europe in general, um, very crypto curious, very crypto friendly. We're starting to see some movement there. Darius, do you think there could be some runs between, since Europe is ahead of us, uh, between say now and the time that the Fed, Fed actually pivots? Uh, yes and no. Uh, so we talked about this in our morning note this morning in terms of the dynamics around European inflation, you know, push into a 40 year high, the UK push into an all time high uh, in the Eurozone, particularly from a core inflation standpoint, how that continues to contribute to inflation volatility, inflation surprises over in the Eurozone, and that's contributing uh, through, our, through the lens of the bond market, the globally interconnected bond market, to more volatility and, 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 and duration here in the United States. So yeah. Europe having its issues with inflation is, is likely to continue to be a, a headwind for markets. To answer your question specifically, I mean, you know, the one thing I would say is mar markets don't ever go anywhere in a straight line. I mean, they, they dance along the path and they get you to their ultimate destination and then you die. Right. And so that's, that's kind of the point where we're going to, you know, there's going to be tradable opportunities, tradable Death. lows, tradable highs along the path. It's just what we're trying to do on this network. And Paul, I really appreciate, you know, you for having us on and you for your thought leadership on this is, is try to help investors get to the other side. You know, right. it's not like, you know, if you're a retail investor, I spend most of my day consulting institutional investors who have to put money to work, who have to make the decisions on a, on a, you know, kind of high frequency basis. If you're a retail investor, particularly if you're a crypto investor, Go grab some popcorn and just watch this movie play out. Learn more, read books, learn how this whole game yeah. works. And the Fed doesn't have your back, and you'll do just fine. You don't need to buy the old, the, the the lowest tick on the price. I mean, I didn't buy Bitcoin until October 2020. It bottomed in early March of 2020. Guess what? Mm -hmm. It still tripled from there. You know, you right. don't have to buy the low. You don't have to be in a hurry. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's something we talk about all the time is right now in these kinds of markets, education is your friend. It's it starts to get you prepped for when the game begins, you know, because right now we're in a very precarious time of how this uh, market plays out. And I know a lot of you guys listening right now, you, you're big into uh, running seed uh, or excuse me, uh, swing trades and scenarios around a lot of different you know tokens out there within the market. We completely get that. and We understand it. We do give you guys a lot of content to that ratio to that ratio. But. Always remember that this is kind of one of the, the guiding lights of really your crypto and or investor journey is market conditions like what we're faced with right now. So stick in there. I think it's going to be just fine. And don't forget, smash the like button. <laughs> I feel like we have, have to always say that because this is something that I talk about with a few people. New people into uh, investing in digital and, and risk assets. And uh, I do these little seminars in our local community and a lot of high net worth individuals come into these things. 
And they're always asking, where can I learn? Where can I understand more about not only the market, but I want to understand about Bitcoin and you know Cardano and X. I want to know about all these things so I at least have a, a bearing on all this. So uh, to your point, I think you're dead on there. I want to get over to Credit Suisse and their involvement going after a Saudi interest here. Does Jeff, you and I talked about this the last time we were on. And big banks having a lot of potential uh, impact here now around sovereign funds and what that may mean into what's happening on a global scale. Because, I mean, we could be losing some, some very interesting opportunities here, especially from a European bank like Credit Suisse. What ha- what's, what's your take on this? Where, where do you see this going? Yeah, so we're clearly in a global liquidity crunch right now. And so what happens when we're in these sort of situations is everybody's collateral that they have suddenly gets scrutinized much more deeply than it does during a bull market. Mm -hmm. And so these banks, with all of their collateral, with all of these assets on their balance sheets, suddenly they start getting repriced lower and some of them start getting replaced much lower. Um, that causes problems for people. It causes problems for institutions, for these banks. So, so basically what's happening is people are starting to wonder, does Credit Suisse, uh, you know, and there are other banks that are involved in all of this stuff too, but do they really have the, you know, the liquidity the, to withstand this drawdown? And the, the credit default swap markets are getting increasingly disbelieving that they do. They're getting increasingly nervous about them. Um, so, you know, as far as Saudi involvement, I look at this is all just part of the course, you know, right? Because pe- people are, um, they're starting to get desperate. They're starting to look for, hey, who will have our back? Who will um, s- supply us with needed liquidity during these tumultuous times? Um, maybe it will be the Saudis. Maybe they'll step in and, and they'll kind of come in and save them. Uh, you know, it's similar. It's not unlike what happened in the crypto markets with the Terra Luna debacle, you know, and then Sam right. bankman fried stepped in and, and you know he's he backs them he's he's kind of the jp morgan of the crypto industry so will that happen will it save some of these banks possibly or, or might they be buying a little bit too early and putting their necks on the line for uh for banks for institutions with you know suboptimal collateral shall we say right, right. Uh, we'll, we'll find out there's more to come like this is not over yet so i'd love to get darius's thoughts on this too well, yeah, I just have a quick sure. joke, but I mean, I'm sure Bank of America would have liked to buy Countrywide in 08 instead of 07. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Like, if you can just wait, I mean, this goes back to the point yes. of the conversation. That, just, just be, be patient. <laughs> that might be the blueprint print right there for you know not screwing up. You know, if yeah. you're in the banking industry, uh, within oh. that, and a lot happening there. If you look at their valuations, because I was looking at the underperformer here against stocks. And uh, Credit Suisse shares, obviously, highly underperforming there. And, and they were talking about the valuation scenario. So is it really, do you feel like this right now is in a position, maybe this is just a good buy, is this just a good buy for someone like this that could come into what's happening within these banks? Because like you said, Jeff, we could see this start to occur in some Western banks as well, uh, especially around liquidity scenarios. Uh, is there any that you're watching right now or anything you're watching in the market that would uh, kind of trigger you to say, OK, we need to really be cautious here with certain aspects from financial institutions? I'm not looking at a lot of specific banks here. Everybody's talking about Credit Suisse. I kind of look at what are the general trends, both from a corporate level and from a sovereign level mm-hmm. as well, watching what you know CDS rates are doing throughout those sectors. The general trends are not good, right? They're all trending higher. They're still not at uh, freak out moments for most of these in general. We're not at right. panic mode time yet, but we're trending in that direction. And that's what makes me nervous. And again, back to Darius's point, there's no reason to rush in here. You know, if, if the Saudis jump in and, and infuse, you know, Credit Suisse, with, Credit Suisse with a bunch of cash, they may just literally be burning that on fire. You know, it, it, that may be what happens. So it it probably would be wiser, I think, for them to hold off for a little bit and to let things, let the dust settle a little bit, let it play out. Because I think we're going to see some some major players fall this time around. Could be Credit Suisse, uh, could be some other banks, but go ahead. You, you have yeah. another question. So, well, I was just thinking to your point there, if, if they were to stand off, I mean, we could see the fall of some major financial institutions. Would that have a potential ripple effect into the economies within not only the Europe zone, European zone, but also kind of the effect on the global aspect from a macro standpoint. In other words, you know, we've already done this in the United States, too big to fail, those kind of scenarios. Could that be the case within uh, Europe around Credit Suisse right now? Would that be a risk if they were to fall? 
Well, absolutely. Uh, yes. Yeah, of course. Go ahead, go uh, ahead Darius. I'll take say, it. Yeah, sorry, Jeff. My apologies. One thing I'll say that's a little bit different this time relative to 2008, um, there's a lot of things that are different for starters, but I think the number one thing as it relates to Credit Suisse is that, you know, we have standing swap on that. We, the Fed, has standing right. swap lines with all these other foreign central banks. And so if dollar funding ever became a real legitimate issue, like we saw on a significant mm -hmm. run on, on, on Credit Suisse's the investment bank's ability to capitalize itself and do its business, then we would see the Swiss National Bank just say, hey, we need X billion of dollars to take care of this problem and we're going to sell them off to the Saudis and X, Y, Z. Now, it doesn't mean Credit Suisse won't go down and won't you know, cause more uh, financial market volatility, but this is not 2008. Right, right. Yeah, I would agree. Um, all right, so let's jump over to the political side of things because not necessarily we're uh, getting into the political aspect of it. What I want to know from you guys is when you look at U.S. midterm elections, um, whether you're Republican or Democrat watching our show, which side of the house, if, if any, or side of the aisle could affect crypto or blockchain risk assets better than others? And I'll start with you, Darius. Do you think there is one side of the current administration or is it possibly the Republican administration that could potentially change the dynamic of where this goes? Uh -huh. I don't think any of these bozos down in D.C. No. knows what they're doing <laughs> with, with, with TradFi regulation, let alone no DeFi That's regulation. Good, so, uh, good luck with that. <laughs> we needed to use that for the show title. None of these bozos know <laughs> what's, going, what's going on. It feels that way, too. Jeff, do you think there's any hope there? On uh, Let's say the Republicans get in. Do, is there any hope that, that the capitalists come in and say, hey, wait a minute, we might do something on regulation here? I'm with Darius on this. I'm totally apolitical, by the way. I don't care who wins. I think they're all about the same. But but the <laughs> lack of education is impressive among uh, impressive. DC uh, br brothers and sisters. So I don't show, take Paul. any good. <laughs> yeah, they need it to watch impressive. your show a lot more, Paul. But there's a handful. I mean, we've had, uh, we've had Congressman Emmers on our show before, and um, he understands a little bit about what's ha what's happening. And he's obviously he was uh, head of their blockchain you know, committee there that was really in charge of trying to at least educate uh, what what many of the lawmakers there in D.C. are trying to do, most of which are trying to chase down lobbyists, whether it's Sam Bankman-Fried or someone else, that are trying to position within the space, which I think is going to be an interesting opportunity for um, crypto in general, Bitcoin especially, of where this might go in the future around regulation. Um, so a lot's happening for sure. Uh, what do you guys make of this? 48,000 Bitcoin withdrawn off of institutions uh, from Coinbase. Uh, this is a potential price surge based on this kind of movement. Again, these are big whale moves. Uh, I know you guys don't track these down to, um, you know, on-chain analytics, but I mean, from a strategy position, you're dealing with certain kinds of investors that are making these kind of moves. What are your thoughts on, on things like this, Darius? Uh, so I, I, I think it's very important to understand sort of what's ha causing that. Because, uh, and I don't know this for a fact, but I do know that, you know, places like Fidelity, et cetera, are really starting to, um, you know, enhance their, uh, the product offering to their customers on things like uh, getting ex exposure to the digital asset space. So maybe they're moving them and custodying them somewhere else so that they can launch a fund or something like that. I don't know. Um, but I think we need to be sort of um, cautious when we sort of, you know, see headlines like that and, and um, you know, kind of you know, put connect the dots because it may not be the same signal that it was in previous uh, previous cycles. Now, again, let me let me be very clear. Markets are going to go up and down and zigzag along the way to their ultimate destination. Right. You know, Bitcoin could easily trade to twenty two thousand very easily on this news or on some other news. But then it'll trade back down to 19 and eventually trade probably down to 17. Yeah. And you know, it, again, the markets don't go anywhere in a straight line. So just be careful you're not overreacting to to you know to to news to to, to bad mm -hmm. signals at the wrong times. Yeah, and further in that uh, article, uh, the Quant CEO talked about it. He says basically they shared a screenshot of the the withdrawal. Uh, this happened on October 18th, and really where it was delivered right here was over to institutional clients. So again, back to your point, you know, is that there are, uh, and I think that we're seeing more of that, and this is probably a good. Uh, you know, a good time in the, po in the show to talk about this is when you look at, and you guys, of course, for you, Darius, talking to a lot of institutions, uh, Jeff, high net worth individuals uh, who are looking at institutions as potentially being a, a segue or a potential, you know, uh, safe haven for digital assets and risk assets in the future. With, with things like this occurring, what's the cycle like between now and the next bull run 
of more institutions actually taking a lot of moves forward versus setting back on their heels right now, waiting to see how the market plays out. Your thoughts on, on it? either one of you can take that. Take it, take it, Jeff. I have some longer term views on that. Sure. So uh, I think we're definitely seeing positive signs of institutional adoption, right? We're still seeing headlines, even in this bear market of institutions finding ways to custody Bitcoin and, and other crypto for clients um, and, and basically making it easier uh, for their clients who are asking for it, by the way. They all say that. They all like to be like, well, we don't, we're not really into this, but our clients are asking for it. So because of the good servants that we are, we're going to provide this service for our clients. And so I think that's what's going on. I, I continue to be um, uh, encouraged by that, by institutional rates of adoption. I think that this is setting the seeds for the next bull run. So basically yeah. when we get through this tough business cycle, I think that it's going to be a, a pretty impressive move higher because of that in the price of Bitcoin. So that, that makes me bullish. One, one thing to your, your final, your point earlier, when we see uh, large amounts of Bitcoin moving off of exchanges, that is generally a bullish sign, right? Um, yeah. you, because what that implies is people are taking it off. They're not going to trade it. They're not going to sell it. They're going to put mm -hmm. it into cold storage and sort of sock it away. That's very good for the long run. But in these current conditions, again, you got to see what the macro is doing. And when the macro points towards ugliness and further downside, you just have to be aware that that's the most likely, the most probable move for assets like Bitcoin, like risk assets, like crypto. Mm -hmm. They're probably going to move down uh, because of the current macro situation. Lock it away. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Darius, you were you were saying you had a, a position on this? Yeah, just from a structural perspective. So, I, I we, you know, one of our core beliefs at 42 Macro from a longer term perspective is that the Fed is eventually going to be forced either through political pressure or by right. financial markets to revise its inflation target higher. We think three will be the new two at some point in this process over the next 18 to 24 months. And in that point in, point in time, it's going to be, or throughout that you know, process, it's going to become increasingly obvious to investors that 60-40 is just, a, for lack of a better phrase, it's a really dumb right. idea uh, in, in that context. You don't need to own as many bonds in a higher inflation world, in a world where inflation yeah. is 50% higher than it was in the prior regime. So I think we're going to go from 60-40 to something like 60-30-10 by the end of this decade. And obviously mm. that 10 is going to be comprised of alternatives, physical and digital commodities, and, you know, alternative investment managers, et cetera, real estate, who knows? Yeah. Well, and, and if you look at the entire market, that really bodes well for obviously digital assets and risk assets for sure, including Bitcoin. Yeah. To your point though, uh, and this is the back to, and we've talked about this many times. I, I know that doesn't matter in many cases to where that, well, it does matter, but to a lot of people, when they look at inflation, uh, we're, you know, we're out of that phase of this is transitory and we got that completely. But where you look at uh, many analysts uh, of which I've talked with that are leaning more towards the positive side of where inflation nests, uh, whether it's three, four, five percent. Is there a point in inflation that you think is a no go zone for the Fed? What do you mean by no go? In, in well, the sense like, that for instance, let's say we get this down to five. You know, mm -hmm. we get into a, a soft five, the economy's doing well, Europe's coming back, the Ukraine war is over, uh, positions are starting to structure, but the United States still has this lingering 5% inflation. Does the Fed look at that and say, this is this is the new floor? What are your thoughts? Absolutely not. No, and no. And no here's way. why. And, so that's a no, yeah, no. no go at 5%. Absolutely not. I think okay. th th three, it, just from the perspective of a bond market where term premium on the long end of the curve, you know, are still deeply negative. Um, you know, that's a very wonky concept, but it just basically means that there's <laughs> there's, a, there's a supply and demand imbalance for bonds right now that's favoring the price of bonds. That yeah. could very easily swing to a, a, a supply and demand imbalance that it very much uh, negatively favors the price of, of the long term duration sensitive in, instruments. And so you're talking about, you know, like for instance, you know, looking at the 1970s example, we saw term premium rise from effectively 100 basis points to about 450 basis points throughout the course of that decade. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, bonds were going down because of fundamental reasons, or bonds were going down for fundamental reasons, but term premium is the additional yield investors demand on top of all those fundamental reasons like the inflation right. expectation you know, the policy rate uh, dynamics, et cetera. So you could see a very substantial expansion on term premia if we go into a much higher inflation regime that is signaled and acquiesced to by the Fed because higher inflation, we've done the statistics on this going back 120 years, 
Higher inflation leads to higher inflation volatility. Higher inflation volatility leads to higher volatility in real and nominal economic growth. And both of those things contribute directly to rider term premia in the fixed income space. Yeah, for sure. I would agree with that. I, and again, I think the big question is, is how quickly uh, we can get this corrected, you know, at least in the status that we're in right now, which is very slow moving. It's very lethargic, the market itself, to be able to uh, bring that back. So interesting stuff, guys. Listen, it's always fun having you guys on. I want to jump to a poll and uh, see what our audience has to say about this one. Here we go. All right, Q1, Q2. I'm getting some wow. feedback there. <laughs> when Lambo, that is Everybody's not looking. my Twitter, my Twitter feed. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'd be in reverse. Twenty twenty five. We went into an echo zone. I don't know what happened there. You guys sent me, but it's gone now. Um, so twenty twenty five. Everybody's really hawkish on this one, feeling that this is going to extend or bullish on this is that uh, this this goes into twenty twenty five. Uh, interesting uh, oh, stuff. Sorry, sorry. Uh, maybe I have the, my crypto terminology wrong. Does win Lambo mean when we buy the dip? <laughs> it's when is it going up? <laughs> when is it? Oh, so people say yeah. it's going to go up through 2025 or it's going to start going up in 2025. Is, yeah, sure when, by 2025, they'll be able to buy Lambo. Is, oh, is gotcha. Thing. Sure. Yeah, of course. I, I don't disagree yeah. with that. I mean, you, you might lose half your money along the way and, and not be able to buy your own. You might lose your house. Uh, you know, I, I love that. You know, return, so right? nonchalant. You might lose half your money along the way. And... Yeah, totally. We'll try. If, if it starts going up in 2024, why do you need to be long it from October 2022 through 20, 2023? Yeah. Why not just buy it on Jan 1st, 2024? Buy your you position. Could, you yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, you guys are crazy out here. All right, a couple of questions <laughs> for you. <laughs> is it possible that the crisis, and we'll go with uh, uh, Zilvanas. Um, is it possible that the crisis and inflation could push some bigger countries uh, to turn to Bitcoin over the next few years? Jeff, you want to take that? It's possible. I mean, uh, is it likely? I would say no. Uh, I think that there's still, it basically, that would lend credence to Bitcoin and it sort of takes away from the credence or the stability of your own sovereign currency. I mm -hmm. think, I think that's kind of how it's viewed right now. Like if sovereign nations adopt Bitcoin in any way, they're giving it serious credence, right? And so I don't think you're going right. to see a sovereign nation doing that anytime soon, unless you're like an El Salvador type situation, unless you're mm -hmm. dependent on another sovereign nation's currency. Sure, could they Could they do that? Certainly, but bigger countries, like they're implying, I would say ones that have their own, curr their own currencies, unlikely in the next few years. By 2030 though, like maybe eight years from now, sure, I, I could see that starting to happen. I could see countries starting to adopt Bitcoin in some sort of Bitcoin plan. Darius disagrees. I, 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 I <laughs> respectfully disagree, my friend, my friend. I, I love it. Let's so, hear you, it. You, you, yeah. And so, you know, if we're, in order for a currency to be a reserve asset, you know, you need to have, it need to be very deep, you know, very liquid, they need to have very deep liquid markets. And more importantly, I would argue it needs to have a military. <laughs> you know, it needs to have a navy to make sure that barrels of oil departing country A make it safely to you know the, the port in country B. You know, you can't just have the whole world you know subject to pirating and all sorts of stuff. And so this is where it comes from, and this whole concept of the exorbitant privilege. It's really a privilege, but it's also a duty as it relates yeah. to maintaining the global order that we have here in the United States. So. Um, and from my perspective, big countries, no, it's just Bitcoin's not the appropriate asset for that, for this solution. I think central banks are going to try with their own digital currencies. It's going to be a, a worse version or for capitalists and, and, and libertarians, it's going to be a worse version of what we already have. But unfortunately, I don't think Bitcoin's a solution. Um, looking at how long the recession could last. So for many people who watch our show, we believe, they believe that we're already in that, in that zone of a recession right now. Where, where do you think this uh, lands on the calendar, Darius? So uh, so we're not in recession. The economy is booming. If you look at, you know, measures of, of you know, monthly GDP, you know, we can price some of these statistics. You know, we're growing at about 9% nominally on a three-month annualized basis, just shy of 4% on a real basis, uh, three-month annualized. You know, industrial production just came out yesterday at 4% annualized three months. In September, retail sales, core retail sales at around, you know, 4% as well. This economy is booming. Labor market, private sector, aggregate labor incomes at seven, eight percent three month annualized. This economy is booming as, as in a way that I've not seen throughout my entire career. Now, we are probably going to head to recession because the economy is booming 
And that means that's going to con continue contributing to resilient core inflation. So ultimately, the Fed is going to have to take its policy setting to a restrictive level that we couldn't even imagine six, 12 months yeah. ago. And we're yeah. eventually going to get the recession. But right now, it's, it's, it's in our opinion, it's in a distant future. Always good stuff, guys. Thank you so much for uh, stopping in today. We'll have to do this one again. I think it's uh, it's very interesting, especially as the market starts to kind of mature into a very interesting zone. And at the end of Q4, we'll get a chance to see some earnings and what that might look like, you know, on the backside for the first quarter. So uh, good to have both of you on. Thanks for stopping in. We appreciate it. Well, Jeff, you guys are Thanks, great, Paul. man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Darius. All right, so you guys are tuned in over on the podcast right now. Jump over here to the YouTube channel. This is where we catch everything, including some of these kinds of dual zone interviews where we take a look deeper into not only the markets, but also what is affecting what's happening in the risk asset business. And whether you're looking at Bitcoin or crypto in general, a lot of the altcoin projects, uh, we do a lot of those breakdowns. Of course, we look at our own sentiment data that really kind of drives where we see the markets going in terms of just action, uh, which usually end up with a little bit of price action here and there. So those are the things that you can always catch here on this show. If you guys, of course, want to jump in and get some of the inside alpha, the way to do that is get into the diamond circle. We do a lot of our own uh, breakdowns on many of the different altcoin projects. All you have to do is join that. There's a link below in the uh, description and it's free. It's easy to do and you'll join you know, tens and tens of thousands of other members that have jumped into that private member group. Easy to do. If you guys want to reach me, it's out there on Twitter, at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.